Hello, my students. How's everybody doing? Hopefully well. Hopefully everybody's fighting the heat. It is very hot right now. And, uh, you know, it's tough to stay motivated and want to do things when it's so hot. So hopefully you hang in there and I can make this class as enjoyable as I can. So that's why this week, uh, if you're still looking at the syllabus, I changed it up for something a little more uh, humorous. So I picked uh, James Thurber. So uh, Yishuan, you'll go to 339 if you've bought the book. And we're gonna talk about uh, humorous, which means a person who wrote funny things. And that's James Thurber. Uh, Again, sometimes I pick something and I get the book and then an author and I just don't have enough information on there. And I have to stretch it out for the length of the class and make sure you have enough questions and there's enough uh, good points to go over, right? Things to learn, right? If there was only one or two and the class was over in 15 minutes, we're not gonna fit the requirements of the school board. So uh, I hope this is long and it looks pretty good, looks pretty funny, so. That's how we'll go. And this is for class 831 as I look to my calendar. So August 31, 2020, okay? And hopefully other than that, everybody's doing well. We're getting close to the end of the quarter. And take a little break and then start the fall. And then wait for the temperature to go down and all the holidays to start. And then the end of the year and then boom, it's the next year. Hopefully there's a vaccine for COVID and we're back in the classroom. So I can actually see you guys and uh, interact with you guys. And, uh, I, I miss that a lot. So, you know, there you go. So, okay. Thank all. Take my face out of the way. And we don't need that there. Okay, so again, school code ENG 103, literature of the West. Week nine, that's a secret. Okay, ready here? So again, this is the person's name. First name is James, last name is Thurber. James was born in 1894 and died in 1961. James was a short story writer and a cartoonist. He was also famous for his cartoons what people would call today anime. And then he was also a playwright. So playwrights usually write things for the theater, okay? and they perform the plays, all right? Get out of there, what's that thing doing coming down for? Oh my gosh, get out, see, and listen to me. Okay, so again, uh, Wani and Ayishwan, we're starting on 339 to the on the left, right? 339 on the left, okay. James Thurber was a short story writer who was considered one of America's greatest humorists. And again, humor means laughter and a humorist is someone who writes funny stories or short stories, cartoons, etc. He focused on the small events of life and the frustrations of the modern world using a wry humor that showed great sensitivity to human fears and follies. Okay, there's some interesting words in there. Some of them are old style words. And People don't use anymore. I remember them as a kid. 
that were going out at that time. So let me start with rye humor. Now, if you know alcohol, this is not alcohol. Alcohol rye is spelled R-Y-E. A rye humor means kind of like a, a dry humor. Not the kind of, you know, like a clown, ho, 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 take a cream pie in the face. This is more like a dry humor or laughing at things that uh, sometimes can be very serious. And you're not laughing in a happy way, but almost kind of like a sarcastic way, you know? Like, how could I say this to you? Like, uh, let's say a man is diagnosed with cancer. Doctor says, uh, you've got a year to live at the most, right? So for most people, there's not gonna be any time for humor there. Maybe crying, maybe sadness, maybe anger. So a person with a dry humor, because again, here it says, showed great sensitivity to human fears and follies. Follies is an old word that it's not used anymore. And follies means kind of like, uh, some bad things that happen to you are just funny somehow. Again, if you have a dry humor. And folly is just like, to suffer folly is like to have an endless like an accident, and things you can't control, right? Like a diagnosis of cancer. So a right humor here would be the doctor tells him he has cancer. He's only gonna be able to live for a year at most. Like I said, most people at this point are gonna be angry or crying. But the person with the right humor says, well, at least I won't have to put up with my mother-in-law next year, right? He finds some kind of humor in that, well, if I'll be dead by the end of the year, then next year I don't have to deal with her because I really hate my mother-in-law. And that is a kind of a dry humor. Uh, Thurber stories influenced later writers such as Kurt Vonnegut. And Kurt Vonnegut wrote a lot of uh, science fiction. Interesting how he was influenced by this humorist. And then Joseph Eller. Thurber's work consisted mostly of, ah, they made a mistake here, shot. If it was a shot story, it means it got shot by a gun. So they're missing an R there. Thurber's work consisted mostly of short stories, which make it easy to write uh, about human fears and follies. Fables, which are just stories that were made up long, long time ago and that uh, are probably not true because they're like impossible to prove. Like, uh, for example, the English have a story about Jack and the beanstalk and there being a giant. Well, there's no more beanstalk and nobody has seen a giant. So it's really hard to prove if that was true or not. Uh, my Korean students always talk about the very first Koreans were bears. So I don't know if you can prove that unless you can get a bear to talk and then they can explain their history to you. So yeah, yeah, we were the first Koreans, my Jayo. So those are fable. Uh, what's my Japanese fable? Um, since uh, Japan has a lot, is famous for a lot of earthquakes, uh, there's a fable about the ones that happened in the Tokyo area for earthquakes. And the ancient fable was when we had these earthquakes, since they didn't understand about seismic this and mountain faults that. Um, they said it was because in Tokyo Bay, there was a giant catfish. 
And every time it got angry and started to shake, it would cause an earthquake. So that's an old Japanese fable. Uh, Thurber's work consisted mostly, okay, we already went over that, and cartoons, because like I said, he's famous for his cartoons. I used to see them in the uh, papers because they played them long after he died. It's that popular. And is collected in more than 30 volumes. So, as we've said in, for other authors, a very extensive writer. Uh, in addition to his fame as a writer, mainly for the New Yorker, I think that's where his cartoons came from, New Yorker magazine. Thurber was well, a well-known artist and a cartoonist as well. Is a surreal, and surreal means something that's uh, probably not real, but looks real. So I, I know you might be a little confused there. So the best advice is um, if you've seen the movie with Johnny Depp, the Alice in Wonderland, it looks real and the cat talks and all this stuff, but it's surreal. It's like, this is not for real, right? The rabbit. So that's uh, surreal. And then we have minimalist sketches were a regular feature of the magazine where they became prototypes of its modern, sophisticated cartoons. I guess they considered them sophisticated because the cartoons dealt with adult themes, you know, businessmen, police, divorce, drinking, you know, alcohol. Whereas the Sunday papers, when I grew up, all the cartoons there were all for young people whether you're a kid to like a teenager or early 20s. So those will not be considered sophisticated since you have Snoopy, Charlie Brown, Fred Flintstone, Pogo Possum, things like that. Okay. And then again, yeah, after the surreal, you have the word minimalist sketches. So something minimalist is just the bare minimum of something not really drawn out or compounded. Okay, James Derber was born on December 8, 1894 in Columbus, Ohio, the son of Charles Derber and Mary Fisher Derber. His father was a minor politician, so nobody major, background, supporting, and his mother was a strong-minded woman and a practical joker. So a strong-minded woman means she had a lot of her own ideas. And a practical joker is the kind of person that likes to play surprise jokes on other people. Uh, for example, a lot of guys like, you know, I, I've had, when I was younger, I couldn't afford my own apartment. I'd have uh, roommates and we'd share an apartment. So a lot of those crazy guys, they would do something like if somebody fell asleep, during the day, maybe on the couch in the living room. One guy would go to the restroom, get the can of shaving cream, put the shaving cream and the other guy that's asleep on the couch's open hand that was closest to his face, and then find the feather or a sock and tickle the guy who's asleep, tickle his nose. So when you're asleep like that, your immediate reaction is the closest hand to your face. You will bring it to your face to scratch your nose because it's itching, except it now has 
you know, a pound of shaving cream in it. So you instantly, bang, you hit your face with shaving cream and wake up embarrassed. So that is a practical show. Uh, Thurber was shot in the eye while playing a bow and arrow game with his brothers and sister, I'm sorry, his brothers as a child, causing blindness in one eye. So this is not at all like you're thinking about something skebe or yahe. This is like, uh, you know, old time weapon where they pull it back and let it fly and the arrow goes into your body except one of his brothers shot it into one of his eyes. And he lost the sight in that one eye. Okay, as a result, he was unable to participate in games and sports with other children. And thus, he developed a rich fantasy life that became the basis of his writing. Uh, just to let you know, I'm just not talking about an injury, but, oh, we just had some more soju. Um, a lot of students, for whatever, they were orphans or they were stuck in their house all the time with no one to play with and nothing to do. Uh, these kids that were not able to as most other kids enjoy their life, they developed in their mind rich fantasy life. I guess some of them, like Mr. Thurber here, uh, became a writer. So I guess these kinds of folks, uh, they're not easy to get bored because their mind is always working. Thurber was elected last president in his senior year at East High School and graduated with honors. So even though with the loss of one eye, he was a very good student. He entered Ohio State University, OSU, in 1913 and struggled with the required gym courses. So again, any type of sports, you don't have depth perception with only one eye. So it's gonna be hard for him to catch a ball or run and jump over something or swing a bat and hit a ball. So he struggled in these gym courses, uh, as well as in science labs. Here we go. Partly because of his poor eyesight. Thurber, Reported for the college paper, which means he was a reporter, The Lantern, and was editor in chief of the Sundial Humor and Literary Magazine. So he was editor in chief. He left OSU in 1918 without taking a degree, so that means he left early. Okay, that brings me to the bottom of a 339 on the left. So we know what follows. It's uh, question time. Doo -doo -doo. So am I gonna ask just a few questions today? Or should I ask a lot? Everybody tired from all the heat? Mm, hope not. Inky has to do her model shoes, you know. So I don't know. Question one.
Okay, number one, James Thurber was considered one of America's what? So let me stretch this out for you. Okay, nice and stretched. Uh, was he considered one of America's best baseball players? Was he considered one of America's best singers? Or was he considered one of America's best chefs at the time with his delicious umeboshi? That was his number one dish, uh, umeboshi. One to two. So, what? did he focus on in his writing? Did he focus on sports? Did he focus on movies? Or did he focus on the political scene in the US. What did he focus on? Okay, moving on to three. Muktuya, you're doing I see you, Muktuya, you're doing bad things right now. You have Temuj and his wallet back. Okay, his work consisted mostly of what? So again, this is what someone like, uh, whatever he's gonna say, who are you talking about? What, what is his he, his, his, I haven't changed it, it's still James Thurber. So his work consisted mostly of what? And with a stretch. So let me see, hints, I always have to give my students hints. His work consisted mostly of Cooking umeboshi, roller skating, or working at the local kimchi factory with me. I used to work at the kimchi factory. Yes, I did. That's true. But it was in a poa, not so. Oh, no, actually, Jeonju. That's where all the good, good uh, food comes from. Okay, four. Or do you want to, I can give you more on this page. Do you want more or is four enough? On the first page we are doing today. Okay, four, why did he develop a rich fantasy life for his writing? Time for some stretchy pool. Okay, hints, why did he develop a rich fantasy life for his writing? So maybe Mr. Hong will say something like, uh, because uh, he was on drugs, uh, I don't know. Or because he worked for 
Walt Disney? What is the reason why he developed a rich fantasy life for his wife? Yeah, probably gonna have to ask Tug Stargot. She will know. Okay, let me give you a few to copy those down. I'll make my own comments, uh, writings. Okay, I've asked you one through four. Three thirty nine on the left hand side, Chico Bobo. So I wonder if any of you missed not coming to class and then going across to Starbucks. I, I I really don't go to Starbucks, but I missed going to class and seeing the students. That was that was fun. It's always fun for me to interact with other students, even though some of them might be violent, like a Pamela, Titan, or Caroline. Have the bolo ready, you know, or Caroline's doing the sea lot, so I have to be ready to defend. Okay, I guess I can. Uh, Go for that eraser. No one seems to be wanting to steal it from me today. Oh, okay. Okay, let me go one. James Thurber was considered one of America's what? So again, if Tim Winchell wants to be funny, he, he was considered one of America's something. Two, what did he focus on in his writing? Maybe gambling, exciting life in Las Vegas. Three, his work consisted mostly of what? Uh, watching TV and eating donuts. Four, why did he develop a rich fantasy life? for his writing. So the answer there might be he didn't know what else to do. That's the first thing that came to his mind, so he went with it. Okay. That's gone. Let me go back to the wonderful reading material. So we ended bring the book check our status so we ended down here down here then they they later had a daughter in 1925 Thurber went to Paris to write for the so that's the end dead money of 339 on the left we're gonna jump over to 339 on the right. Okay, so he later went out to write for the Chicago Tribune. Went to New York City the following year to report for the New York Evening Post. He joined the New Yorker in 1927, which was newly established. And it was there that he found his clear, concise, Rose style. Oh, I'm scratching my eyes. Uh, so clear, we all know clear. Concise means really to the point writing, right? So let's say someone's writing about food and they're trying to cover as many different categories of food as they can. Meats and sauces and vegetables and breads, right? It's all over the place. But concise, the person's going to pick one area and stick to it. Maybe just the most delicious sauces in the United States, right? Very concise. 
And then prose style just means uh, it's uh, writing style. Yes, sir. Thurber's first book. Oh my God, what a title. <laughs> I'm gonna pass out. Is Sex Necessary? Personally, I don't know what sex is. I think I'm going to have to go to the library that is closed and try to find out what is sex. You know, one time I had a student many years ago. He's an older Korean man. And he had a difficult time saying or pronouncing the word, the number six, right? Four, five, six. So one day we were going to have a party, all the students in class, which we never did at the Sierra or, I mean, uh, East. That's too bad. Maybe the future. So he decided to stop by McDonald's and buy some hamburgers for the students. We only had a small class at the time. So he stopped by, and then the cashier was a Mexican lady. He said that also had a hard time pronouncing in English. So after she asked him, you know, can I help you? He said, I want sex. So before he could say burgers or hamburgers, she started screaming that the Korean man in front of her wanted to have sex with her because he could not pronounce six correctly. So instead he wanted sex, hamburgers. So that's why I don't know is sex necessary? Maybe not, but I think hamburgers are, right? Okay, so this book, which was co-written with his New Yorker colleague, E.B. White, was a parody or a joking writing of the popular sex and psychology books of the day. So they were making fun. Again, there's that dry wry humor. They had, uh, I guess, popular books written about sex of the day. So by making a joke book about this kind of situation, they're making fun, dry fun of these authors with these kinds of uh, titles. Okay. The book contained Thurber's drawings on the subject and instantly established him as a true comedic, again, comedy, humor, talent. So that made it solid that he was a funny guy. Thurber occasionally looked to his background for his work. That means he looked to his background for insight, for history, and for stories that he could contribute to his current writings. He depicted his comedic mother, which means he wrote about his mother, but didn't use her name. So the person just was like her or her personality. In the book, My Life and Hard Times, 1933. And reportedly, based on his father, who had dreams of becoming an actor or lawyer. Uh, the typical small, slight man of many of Thurber's stories. I guess his father was slight, which means kind of small framed and uh, not heavy at all, probably very thin. And I did say small before, so kind of like what we call women that are Small, sometimes tiny, we call them petite, which is a French word we borrowed. And, uh, for example, like in women's clothing, you could be a small size because you are, I don't know, five feet tall, five foot one. But some girls still might have kind of large shoulders or big hips or long arms, but the girls that has more tiny 
body, uh, body structures, they would be considered petite. Um, so for the men, you call them slight, you don't call them men petite. So the slight men of many of Thurber's stories, again, would copy him after his father. During his career, Thurber experimented with many types of writing. He said that his ideas were influenced by the Midwestern atmosphere. He grew up in movies and comic strips. Thurber and his wife divorced in 35, 1935 to be exact. And he married Helen Weismer, an editor, after the ending of his first marriage. I, tell me, Jen, how many times have you been married? 10? Oh, I think I better warn, uh, you know, who Todd. I don't know if she wants to be wife number 11. I want to protect Paul. Uh, she's innocent. Not like Yinky. <laughs> uh, Thurber reduced his role, working less hours, at the New Yorker in 1933 from staff member to contributor. In 1939, he collaborated, which means worked with college buddy, buddy means friend, Elliot Nugent on the male animal. That was a play. So. A play about OSU or Ohio State University, which was an enormous, which means huge success on Broadway. Thurber published For Our Time. And further fables for uh, our time, I think he says. Yeah. So continuing. Again, if I didn't mention enormous success on Broadway, just probably went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And every time they wanted to stop, they said, one more week. Thurber then published two collections of fables, again, stories that are 99% probably not true because they cannot be proven. During his lifetime, Fables of Our Time, published in 1940, and Further Fables for Our Time, 1956. Wow, 16 years later, it took him to write a follow-up. Uh, can you imagine here if they did a movie and then waited 16 years to do the follow-up? Actors would look uh, quite a bit different. Fantasy was his forte, and critics believed or considered these two works among Thurber's best. Well, that's where he did it. Ready to continue, or should I get some more soldier? I'll read it again. Fantasy was his forte, and forte means his best skill. And some critic, critics consider these two works among Thurber's best. In them, he gives age-old wisdom a new and humorous twist. So wisdom is usually passed down by sayings over time. So like, don't bite your hand to spite your face. Have you ever heard that one? That means if you're angry with your face, don't bite your hand because you're angry with your face because you're just going to hurt your hand. It doesn't make any sense. So that just means don't do foolish things that don't make sense just because you're angry, which a lot of people will do because they can't control their anger. Uh, so John Updike is mentioned next, has said that Thurber's genius was to make of our despair a humorous fable. So despair is a situation where people feel that they don't have hope either about their future or about something that has happened to them that is very bad. He would like to take the situation and their feeling and make it into a humorous fable. 
in the fable, the Shrike and the Chipmunk, a female chipmunk leaves her husband and says that he will never survive on his own. But he gets along fine until she returns and gets them both killed during their morning walk. She insists on taking uh, <laughs> she insists on taking it's moral or the meaning of the story early to rise and early to bed makes a male healthy and wealthy and bed okay which again that's the right here murray's making fun of the old saying early to rise and early to bed makes a man healthy wealthy and wise so that was just saying no late hours no drinking no chasing crazy women and you will be okay but here they turn into the opposite because of his dry humor. Here at the very bottom here, one of Thurber's most famous works was his 1947 story, Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Okay, so finishing up the bottom, one of Thurber's most famous works was his 1947 story, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, which they've made into a movie. I doubt if you have seen it. The title character is a meek, though so meek is another word for saying weak or someone that doesn't really have a strong personality. Uh, mild manner means soft and kind. A hand-pecked husband who escapes his everyday existence through heroic fantasies. Okay, so I have to throw hand-pecked out there. If you're a hand-pecked husband, it means you have no rights in the marriage. The person who has the power is your wife, and she will tell you what to do and when to do it. Know the Korean is a gongchaga. I forgot the Japanese for henpecked. Uh, but uh, I have a friend, unfortunately, that is henpecked. I hadn't seen him in five years. I ran into him when we used to have the borders book chain. I met him with his new wife. I was shocked that he was married. She was not the friendliest lady I've met. And we found out that we worked very close to each other in K-Town. So he invited me on a, I met him on a Sunday. He invited me on Friday after work to walk over. That's how close our two uh, places of work were, on Westmoreland and uh, Wilshire. And uh, he had me walk over to meet him and we were gonna go have dinner together. So I did that after my work. I met him at his job. We walked into his parking lot and he started driving to the restaurant since we had not done anything for five years. And then this phone rang, his wife called immediately and I heard her and she said, what the hell are you doing? Where are you going? I'm with uh, Barry, we're gonna go have dinner, remember? And she said, no, you're not. You're gonna take him back to his job and you're gonna come home immediately. He said, well, honey, I want it. She said, no, I have spoken. Forget it, it's over. So that's henpecked. So in this story, the henpecked husband, he escapes his everyday pain and existence through heroic fantasies, but then it's his humor is. So this brings me to the bottom of 339 on the right, each one. So you know now it's time for questions. Hey, oops, I didn't want to go there. Hello. You need to see me. Here we go. Whiteboard. Okay. Pencil. So my question here is, do I have another set of more questions? 
do I? Let me see here. My students want me to be kind. Oh, okay, I won't say anything. We'll just see how many questions you can take. Okay, here we go. Okay. When Thurber, question five, when Thurber joined the New Yorker magazine, what did he find? Did he find, oh, uh, well, let me search it out first. Did he find his new wife? Did he find a new car? Did he find the First Starbucks open in the United States. What did he find? Next one, six. Okay, so one of those questions that you have to know every time we discuss a new writer. Doing okay, Pamela Titan? I hope so. I heard the police helicopter again. They asked me on the phone, where is Pamela Titan? But I won't turn you in. Don't worry. Just give me some money later. Six, what was the name of his first book? Like I said, all the authors, I ask you this question. You at least have to know the book connected to the author. So what was the name of his first book? guesses but if you went over the material you should know it next one Okay, seven. Where did Thurber look for material in his writing? Uh, it says occasionally, you can find it there in the writing. So where did Thurber look for material in his writing? Occasionally. Okay. Stretch it out. Okay, some hints. Did he look in his closet for material in his writing? Did he look inside his shoes for material in his writing and then writing stories about athlete's foot? Or in Japanese, we know as Mizuboshi. I wonder what it is in Chinese. Okay, so where did Thurber look for material in his writing? Uh, do I have more questions? I had four the last time. Oh my gosh, could I do another one? Let me see. Oh, there we go. Hi, yeah. Okay, eight. Eight, it has been said his genius 
was what? What exactly was his genius? Again, should we go back to his ability to make a high level omeboshi? What was his genius? Was he a great dancer of uh, hip hop? What was his genius? So I had four on the first page. Question Jones, I have four here. Maybe I have one more, oh my gosh. Yes, I do. I'm really pushing it here. But the information is so good. Don't start yelling, Mr. Hong. Nine. This is the IPA, I promise. This is the last one for 339 on the right. What was one of his most famous works in 1947? So you see, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't just say what was one of his most famous works. I gave you the year. I didn't ask for it. So that would hopefully make it easy for you to find it. Okay. Exactly what I'm asking for. So I'll give you some minutes to write all these five questions down. You guys went kind of quiet there, are you okay? Everything okay? Hey, I'm gonna go for my eraser pretty quick. Okay, it's time for the eraser. Okay, I've got it. Five, when uh, repeating, when Thurber joined the New Yorker magazine, what did he find? I think he found his new wife. Or he found some cockroaches under his desk. Six, what was the name of his first book? Again, if you follow the material, that should be easy to find. Seven, where did Thurber look for material in his writing? Maybe his closet. Eight, it has been said his genius was what? Again, I'm going for the cooking skill. Nine, what was one of his most famous works, 1947. Okay, so let me mark off that I asked you these questions. Six through nine. Let me finish 339 on the left. So let me go back to uh, the material. Okay, you see that we ended down here. Humor is 
right? So I have to proceed to uh, next one where it says emotional chaos. Just to let you know, uh, Yishwan and Wani, that's 340. And uh, as you can see here, where's that arrow? This is the last of our readings. So this is our last page. So it's not 340 on the left. It's just 340. Okay. All right. So here we go. Emotional chaos. That's just with his description of humor. Humor is emotional chaos remembered in tranquility. Ooh, it's going to be tough for me to translate, but I'll give it my best shot. So chaos, if anybody knows chaos, some people spell it with a K instead of a C. doesn't matter. It's like I told you before, we have the East Coast tomato, and on the West Coast, we say tomato. We know what each other's talking about, even West Coast herb, H is silent, and the East Coast herb. So chaos is a state of where there's absolutely no control. No police are controlling, no army. People are killing each other, and it's violence. It's just chaos. So humor is emotional chaos. Remembered in tranquility, and tranquility is like what the Japanese call zazen. You're completely relaxed. You don't have any worries on your mind. You are tranquil, like a calm lake. Okay. So in other words, what that's trying to say in everyday English is that probably during a chaotic time, a painful time, crazy time, uncomfortable time, later we remember it with peace. And that's why at least in the United States here, if you go through hard times and you don't like it, years later, when you overcome these things, at least the Western mind tends to remember those hard times with kindness and not the pain that you really went through at the time. Okay, so this is what Thurber believed. It was taken up by a psychologist and the Walter Mitty, remember the thing that he wrote, <laughs> syndrome was put forward in a British medical journal as a clinical condition, which manifested itself in compulsive fantasizing. I don't know if that's really fair, but um, I guess there are some people that endlessly fantasize instead of dealing with the world as it is. They're so unhappy with their life circumstance that it's better to live uh, in their mind as a fantasy. I might have a friend like that. I'd like to talk to him more about it and help him out, but I don't think he has to talk. I think he'd rather live in the fantasy. So it can't happen. Uh, Thurber, Thurber's failed first marriage and his declining health, which means his health was going down probably quickly, steadily darkened his outlook as he aged. So to darken someone's outlook means uh, he got more and more depressed as he got older, not happy like he was when he was younger. So it is noticeable in his writing as he looks at or writes about kind of depressing things, right? So for example, 10 of the 47 pieces in Further Fables, for our time. Remember the first one was just fables. This is further. I think it was written 16 years apart. Consisted of lightly veiled essays supporting free speech. So lightly veiled means lightly covered. If you wonder what a veil is, uh, the lady from Saudi Arabia who does the 
belly dancing usually comes out with the veils and one by one she takes them out. Usually there's a seven. I don't know why seven is a magic number, but it is. The New Yorker refused to publish some of these fables, see? Although the collection had just won the American Library Association's Liberty and Justice Award for 1956 because of political pressure. This is a recurring theme in life. Um, many times, something that should win doesn't win, but political pressure makes it win. And then other people, like it said, the New Yorker refused to publish some of these fables. So um, a couple years ago with the Oscar, the number one movie that people could not stop talking about, just made so much money and it was very obvious it was going to uh, with the Oscar movie. I don't remember what the name of it was, but <laughs> Ryan Gosling was in it. It was about dancing. I never saw it. And then at the last second, some kind of unknown film beat it out. And the theme of that film was about a young gay black man and his lovers. I didn't see that. I mean, it was basically unknown, the film. So a lot of people feel that that was, they made that win by political pressure. They said, it's time we have a film about a gay character who win the Oscar, even though this other film had the, you know, ever popular Ryan Gosling with the ladies and made so much more money than this small, basically unknown film. So. Later, it says Thurber was blacklisted by the House of Un-American Activities. I'll have to explain that a bit for that's a 1950s culture. Okay. If you're taking my history class, we talked about it, about China and the Cold War. So after World War II, Russia was called the Soviet Union. They were communists. They were the most powerful communist country in the world. And they were openly seeking to turn as many countries communist as they could. So they were America's number one enemy because we do not believe in communism. We believe in capitalism and uh, free liberties. So, they didn't fight a war where they had soldiers attacking each other. Instead, they fought over countries. And that's why they called it a cold war instead of a hot war. So we fought over Cuba. Cuba became communist. We fought over Korea. Korea became divided, the North communist and the right, a Democrat, a Democrat democracy. In China, China was later involved in this time a little bit also. So that being said, at this time, it says Thurber was blacklisted by the House of Un-American Activities Committee. So we, at least the government at the time, anybody that they found out had any kind of <laughs> affiliation or connection to the Communist Party, whether that was actors or writers, or anybody in the arts industry, they were blacklisted, which means they could not do what they did. So if you were an actor, you could not act for a number of years. If you were a writer, you could not write for a number of years because they stamped on you. You were a communist and you're anti-American. Okay. Next. By the 1950s, Thurber was almost completely blind, but he continued to work. I have found out from other people that people who lose eyesight in one eye when they're very young, a lot of times as they 
get to be older and get to be a senior citizen, somehow it, it strains or affects the other eye and eventually they start losing sight in the other eye too. Very scary. I would have hoped that when you lose one eye, the other eye becomes very strong, but I guess it becomes weak from overuse. So proceeding. He published Modern Fairy Tales for Children. The 13 Clocks, 1950. The Wonderful O, 1957, which were both quite successful. His children's tales displayed, or that means to show, a cynical undercurrent and showed at times a great deal of bitterness. Ooh, ooh, got to explain there. Remember it said earlier that as he got older and his failed first marriage and his declining health he started to have a darkened outlook or a depressive outlook on life. Because I guess he felt, I'm not gonna get remarried, I'm not gonna have a woman, I'm losing the sight of my other eye, and I'm very sad about my future. And it showed his writing. So again, it says his children's tales displayed a cynical undercurrent, so cynical, is a person that is very, very hard for them to believe any kind of positive news. Anything you tell them, they'll tell you, well, I don't believe in that, or I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, again, if I tell you about some of these different friends I have, I have a friend right now, he's very, very cynical. And he's given up on, I guess, finding love in his life. And I tell him, you know, because he, he will say, well, it's impossible. It's a fantasy. And I don't believe in fantasies. And I tell him, you know, you never know who you're going to meet, who you're going to find. Maybe there'll be a sweet lady out there who will love you. And I mean, I'm his friend, so I wish him the best. I don't want to wish him anything bad. And uh, he just gets more and more angry with me because he's very cynical. And he says, don't talk to me about fantasies. It's a complete fantasy that that will happen. It's never going to happen. And I accept it. So, Okay, so that's cynical. And then he showed at times a great deal of bitterness. So bitterness is after you've suffered some kind of loss, physical, financial, emotional don't really seem to get over it and you're very, very angry about that happening. You had a bad business deal and you lost your home. Or you lost money gambling in Vegas, you know, something like that. And you're very bitter that those things happened. So he was probably bitter that his health was declining. It didn't seem like he could meet another woman. And then his uh, other eyesight was going bad. So not good. It's hard to be positive. So despite his poor eyesight, Thurber continued to compose stories in his head. Again, he always had that fantasy, rich fantasy in his mind. Which is good. It will keep you going. And he played himself in 88 performances of the play, The Thurber Carnival. So it didn't mention earlier that he was also an actor. So I didn't know that he actually had acting ability, but if he was the writer and the plays were well written, then it makes sense that he could at least be halfway decent as an actor, stage performer. He knows all the. <laughs> the dialogue by heart, he wrote it. Uh, continuing, Thurber published his memoirs, which again is, means his life story, under the title, The Years with Ross. Very funny. Um, you know, he's not saying the years with himself, but instead he's talking about 
uh, refers to his former boss at the New Yorker, Harold Ross. So I guess they had a pretty good relationship, deep relationship. So he deferred to his former boss and didn't do the egotistical route and say, my wonderful life or Thurber's life. Uh, Thurber's writing continued to appear in the New Yorker until his death. But like I said, when I was younger, they still republished some special things about him once in a while. Uh, during his life, he received a number of honorary degrees, which are, again, they're just respecting his writing and his accomplishments. They're honorary, so he didn't actually go for four years or two years to get a master or a PhD. Uh, so here, including doctorates, which is basically a PhD, from Kenyon College, Williams College, and uh, Yale University, among others. In later years, Thurber and Helen Weismer lived at West Cornwall, Connecticut. He collapsed, which means he physically fell down with no energy. One evening after a theater opening and lingered a month, which means, how can we say this? Hung on, lived for a month. He didn't pass away that night after the collapse. Before finally succumbing, which is a high level word for giving into respiratory failure, which means he couldn't breathe anymore. November 2nd, 1961. Yeah, when the lungs quit, then you usually have respiratory failure. Okay, you want me to get to the questions now? These will be the, we finished the writing, I mean the reading. So the questions will be the last writing for the evening. Or should I say, let me go to the restroom I'll be back in 30 minutes and then we'll finish the rights. Does that sound good, Temujin? No? I can do it. Okay, I guess I won't. I'll be kind. I do not have to go to the restaurant. Okay. This would be question 10. Ten, what did Thurber say about humor? Did he say humor is not funny or I don't like humor or humor bad? What did he say? Let me stretch it out. On to Elebon. Oh, it doesn't want to write. There we go. His children's stories later displayed what? Okay, hints. My guess is if these are children's stories, uh, later <coughs> they displayed clowns, uh, candies, uh, balloons. What did they? Display. And if you believe me, you're in trouble. Okay. Do, how many more questions do I have? Muktuya said she wants 10. How about I just do half of them? Five more, and that will be seven on this page. Wouldn't that be exciting? What does he say? 
one more or you're gonna kill Temple Jet. Okay. I guess I won't need one. One more. I'll be kind. And I'll be put of you would be the only Mongolian guy in class. We can't have that. Even though he's my buddy. Right, Bernie? Well, what was the name of his memoirs? Okay, again, memoirs are the story of his life. Stretch that. So the only hint I can give you there is um, maybe his name is not in the title. That's the best I can do, okay, without actually giving you the answer, even though I know other students will try to trick me Hey, Jerry, what's the answer for number 12? And then I start saying it, and, then, <laughs> and we tricked you. I'm trying to avoid that, right? Right, white, rie, that's right, you know that, but you don't. Okay, let me give you a few minutes to write those down. Let me make my markings. Write down that I have fast to 10, 11, and 12. And for Yishuan in uh, Wan Yixie, um, 300 and uh, somebody moved my pages here. What's going on? Okay, so the last page is 340. That's it. Okay. So. But he's doing okay. That's good. I wish everyone well. Everybody stay healthy. Do not catch COVID 19. Wear your mask and uh, be kind to each other. I'm not running into a lot of kind people lately. So hopefully, you guys will be kind to other people. Because remember, there is a word called karma. You do bad things to people, it will come and get you. Later, it will bite you like a tiger okay. or a bear. So let me grab the eraser. Okay, 10, what did humor, or Th Thurber, <laughs> I guess I'm getting sleepy, huh? What did Thurber say about humor? He said it was not funny. 11, his children's stories later displayed what? I'm gonna say clowns and balloons. 12, what was the name of his memoirs? The only hint I can give you is that his name was probably not in the title, okay? All right, so um, I think that's it for today. So thanks for coming to class. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next time. So uh, good luck with everybody, okay? And, uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.